and we're continuing to move it forward. And I, I really want guests that I think can provide a message that is not what people generally want to hear, but sometimes need to hear like real, real world experiences from people that have actually done it. Um, yeah, I think, I think, sorry to interrupt. I, I, I think it? people are afraid to tell the truth, you know, like in, for faculty members, they're wearing their suit, they're in front of the classroom, they're pretending to have been born, you know, in an oration. You know, like, I'm mid-sentence talking about physiology, I was just born here. You know, that's the impression that students often have. And we were all like sloppy messes. I mean, everyone was. Everyone. And, and indecisive, trying to figure out how to arrive somewhere rewarding. And, and pretending the truth is otherwise is a disservice to everyone who hasn't yet arrived hasn't yet arrived in whatever terminal, you know, uh, career they're in. Um, and so, yeah, telling the truth is, I think, like, necessary. I think I wish people told me the truth. Oh, I was a sloppy mess, too. Let me tell you how I got out of that. You know, I, right. I think that's helpful. Yeah, I agree. And, and I think, I don't know where a lot of it comes from. I'm sure some of it's rooted in psychology and people being insecure with what they really know. And I, I think insecurity is, is, is the great inhibitor of honesty. Right. Like this is why people ask me about character traits that I look for in students. It's really like self-awareness to actually do self-awareness and really understand where things come from is uh, it takes work. Right. You're not. Just working. Saying, oh, why do I feel hard. This why do I feel this way? Yeah. But in self-awareness is is often if you look for it deeply, there's truth. You find the real mm -hmm. reason of what's going on. Right. I once I committed to that like my junior year after I was probably a year and a half behind, then it clicked and it, it, I just figured it out. And so, but it was only when I actually came to terms, it was like, all right, stop faking it. Like, why are you trying to impress people? Like, just what do you actually want? Like, what are you actually interested in? And once I did that things, I don't know why people hold back and they don't do that. Yeah. I mean, I like, I think it's important to acknowledge that people change in life. You know, if you're the same person at 14 as you are at 40, we have a developmental discussion to talk about. I mean, something went, something is tragic here. And so anybody whose sound of mind and emotion has undergone a lot of change throughout their life. Um, and so part of that is like changing your degree, changing your career aspirations. I did the same thing uh, mm -hmm. in my under, I was an art major. You know, like everybody when they're like the ignorance of, of youth I remember I was graduating sixth grade. Did you have, at the, when you graduated elementary school, was there a little graduation where they ask all the kids what they want to be when they grow up? I did not have that. I went to a Catholic school, which was K okay. through eight. So I, I, ended, oh, okay. I ended up going, I ended up switching to public school, but it was already in sixth grade at that point. Okay. So I missed out uh, on that graduation. But, uh, but So I, I remember going to that and I'm a sixth grader. And, and at that point, I think I said athlete professional athlete, baseball player or something like that. Um, but, y you know, gender norms of the era, every boy wanted to be an astronaut or an athlete and every girl wanted to like work with horse, be a veterinarian or do something with horses or whatever. Um, and, and not one person, it, it, I don't know, maybe somebody, but my, my, my strong assumption is not one person to actualize those goals. But then once people are old enough, well into their teens, you can start to formulate some sort of, maybe not the right decisions, but something more concrete, something more believable. And so when I started undergrad, I wanted to be an artist. And like, a, it's something where it would pay, you know, a couple of dollars. So like I was thinking like graphic artist, logo design, corporate identity, something like that. And I was taking it kind of seriously. I mean, I took a ton of college courses. Um, I was job shadowing graphic artists. Uh, I, I even had like freelance gigs and stuff but i eventually i eventually came to this realization that if i wanted to make a dollar or let alone like twenty five thousand dollars a year or something like that doing art i would have to sur completely surrender my integrity um I, I just treat it soullessly and i couldn't it was too precious to me, you know, right. whether it's visual art, fine arts, you know, literature, fiction, things like that. Those are too artistic, too precious. Um, and so I was like two years into my undergrad when I decided I have to switch to the sciences because like I can treat sciences um, sort of without pity. And it's just science is mechanical. And so I can treat it mechanically. Um, yeah. And, you know, there's no warmth. I don't need to cuddle it and cradle it and defend it. I can just 
I do it for like wage labor, but then it came, you know, so I, I transferred into the sciences. I did my undergrad at Willamette University in Salem, Oregon, really, because it was like three miles from my house. Um, but I'm glad I did. It was, it was a really profitable experience for me. But so I, I switched into the sciences and figured out that it was going to be like, what am I interested in? And like human performance. I mean, I was doing bodybuilding at the time. Right. And I think I had just finished the last show I'd ever done when I, when I switched. And so human performance, you know, uh, muscle hypertrophy and back pain. <laughs> Those were my three interests at the time because I had already, you know, a bad back. Um, and so I switched into that direction although at that school there was another Courtney Jensen female obviously and she was an art major and I would always get her mail you know every every student had there's a mail room every student had a mailbox she was an art major she was an art major which is what you wanted to do going was what I wanted to do um and I, I I don't think I ever met her I don't recall meeting her but I got so much for mail like these invitations to parties I'm looking like I don't know any of these people and then I just I eventually realized this I this is the wrong Courtney Jensen um, but yeah, wow. so I, I wound up, I changed and, and I was late. So I, I mean, half my undergrad was art class, maybe not half, but a great deal of my undergrad was art classes. And so when I sw- switched into you know health and exercise science, exercise physiology, this area, um, I, I was a year behind. So yeah, I was on the five-year undergrad program, which I think a lot of people, um, I think it's a mistake to just rush through these things, commit to something, you know, put on the blinders and just sprint to the finish line um, out of fear of being distracted off course, enticed off course by something that actually connects with you more. Um, I think that's a mistake when people do that. Sometimes it ends happily, but often it doesn't. Yeah. One of the things that I have to be careful sometimes and how I convey it in the classroom is I tell students about like, there is real importance in suffering, but I tell people the importance of suffering and working through it and figuring it out. And then it's never going to be perfect, but you're better off to get started because then there's only opportunity for growth. If you keep working at it and you commit. Yeah, there's only opportunity if you create opportunity. And I, and I think that's because like, what do people remember? They remember things are super interested in and things that were hard on them. That's, right. that's like it. That's all the people. And so things that you're not really interested in, but you kind of aspire to, like, I remember wanting to learn a bunch of languages because I was so impressed. I'd get into a taxi and, you know, the cabbie is illiterate in like six languages, seven languages. You know, they can kind of communicate basically in, in you know, right. French and Spanish and Russian. And, and you just go through this list of languages. And I was always so impressed by that person. I thought that was more impressive than getting a PhD was being able to just in casual conversation. But but my aspiration to know all those languages, I was not interested in the languages. And so, man, I struggled to learn those things. I, mean, I was doing Pimsleur's French. I was doing all, I was putting in so much effort every day to become, you know, like yeah. trilingual. It was, it was obviously English and then um, Japanese and, and French. I did Japanese for four years in school and I never got good at anything. And I was just like, I like English a lot. I really don't care about other languages I, I i can recognize their utility and the the beauty of of diverse culture and i can continue yeah. to be impressed by the cabbie but i actually don't have any interest in being that person so it's so hard for me to learn but things that i'm interested in i hear it once and i remember it forever or horrible experiences i remember right. every detail and those sorts of i mean just look at when when students are taking notes by hand that effort works you know Mm -hmm. or if you're trying to read something sloppy and like man i'm having a hard time getting through this you remember and you ask those people like a year later what did it say they still remember because of the challenge to you know um decipher that code um whereas Mm -hmm. like okay i'm gonna read big font calibri and i'm not interested in the message well you're gonna forget that in an hour and so i think challenge is critical um to the educational and development experiences yes yes so i I love that you brought that up and you know before we'll talk we can definitely talk more about this if you're interested and i want to ask more about your story too but one of the things that that since we're on the topic is 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 the science of learning really is kind of like of and you're hitting on a lot of points about how people approach and like what are some of the sticking points that actually make people remember things and i feel right you know, sometimes what people have is, is like, well, you know, if I read something and then 20 minutes after I read it, I can remember bits and pieces of it, but I, I can't remember the whole 
story as I listen to it, if I'm doing an audio version of the book or if I read it, I can't recall exactly the story, but I get the gist, you know, the twenty percent that I if if someone asks me about it, I can I can cover that. But you miss so much because you really spent time. And I guess is that your brain from your perspective, just figuring out like this is important. I'll hang on to this. This stuff is just mostly confirmatory stuff that isn't really the core part of the argument. Like you remember the exit to get off the highway, right? You, you remember how to put the car in gear. You remember how to get this, come up to speed, but like, do you really remember getting from, you know, when you're on the Jersey turnpike for two hours from New York city, do you really, did you count the billboards? Right. (laughs) Right. 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 But that's all detail that you're missing. Mm -hmm. So, so I don't know from your perspective and what, what you've seen as someone that, you know, has been at, um, the in higher education for the last eight years what are some of the things that when when students come to you and say you know dr jensen you know how can i really improve my ability to study and learn the material what do you tell them yeah really good question i mean and you have to admire the students who are honest enough and self-reflective enough to Mm -hmm. know that they can improve like, well, I'm a bad learner. Please, I, everything's improvable. Um, and so, I like I remember when I first started listening to Audible, I wasn't good at it. I, you know, my mind would wander. Three, four sentences go by, and I, I dial back in. And and it takes practice. Everything to you get good at everything through practice. There's no such thing as as somebody who's magically good. You were bad at everything at the beginning. It takes practice. Maybe there's aptitude differences. Certainly, there's aptitude differences. Um, but whatever it is people are starting, whether it's art, you know, visual art or something like that, every, you know, Leonardo da Vinci was terrible when he started. Sure. Um, you're a musician, like Eric Clapton was terrible when he started. Everybody's terrible at everything. And learning is a skill, just like painting, you know, just like statistics. You know, the learning is, is a skill. And I, I'm not a psychologist, you know, right. I don't even have a minor in it. Um, but I, if you just pay attention to your own experiential um you know, endeavors of, of learning and how you learn and watch other people, the, the people who try, who try to improve, who really focus and, and put in conscious effort, always get better. I mean, it's like 100% of the time. And is they get that better. inherent? Is that inherent to a person or can that desire to improve? Oh, I'm sure that I'm sure that's like, there's a genetic difference in, in people's um, ambition. I'm, I'm sure there is. Um, yeah. Now, can I explain it? No, but I mean, look at how diverse ambition is throughout the world. Some of it is, I'm sure, you know, parents rearing their kids to to have high, you know, goals for themselves. But it's not all that. You know, some people really just dig deep and work through whatever, and and self betterment is their life goal. And others, we're all lazy. You know, none of us count the billboards. Um, right. Or, and so, and, and our, our, I think our memory is exactly as lazy as we are. It's easier to just sit down and don't do anything. But, but if the gunshots are coming in through the window, you're going to get up and move. Anytime there's threat, anytime there's risk, danger, anything like that, I think we really assign importance to it. Um, and what's the risk of not knowing your exit? Uh, gas money, waste of time, you're late to a meeting, you're frustrated, you you know, there's lots of potential risks, but what's the risk of not knowing how many billboards you passed? Like, it doesn't matter. You mentioned something about career and job, and I think when people start talking about, you know, work-life balance, and like, oh, I really need work-life balance, my vacation is coming up, and I assume those people are are not really connected with their job. because if you if you derive enormous satisfaction with your job, that's your that's like why do you need to balance it with other satisfying things? You, you, whether it's like your your social quota is being met, your your sense of civic duty, your curiosity, um, all of these things, if they're incredibly satisfying, incredibly rewarding in your line of work, you've chosen the right line of work. And you, those people never talk about work life balance. They just want to keep doing it. Like, oh, I love this. It is my hobby. It's like talking about. Um, you know, Marie is my wife. She's actually just right over there and, and talking about like my wife and my best friend, you know, this is my career and my hobby. You know, it's like two things, you know, put into one. And I think that's so important. And I think people go into jobs often 
totally for the, can we talk about that for a second? People's yeah. aspirations or motivations, what do, you know, I, I, going back to this idea of, I graduated sixth grade and said baseball player or whatever. Every, yeah, there's some astronauts and, you know, um, and I think a lot of people when they're teenagers, I, I listen to students tell me, you know, okay, what, where are we headed? What direction do you want to go? And a lot of them will say things, I mean, they're, you know, I don't know, 19 or something like that. And they'll say things like um, neurosurgeon, you know, or like a cardiovascular, so it's always like a surgeon for some reason, you know, it's not just plain old doctor, plastic surgeon. And to a 19 year old, I don't think those jobs, I don't think they understand them any more than I understand, you know, being a possum, you know, or, or like, like a drug kingpin, or, or I don't understand those things. Um, but I don't think the students really understand what it means. I, I think what they see themselves doing, I think what these students, how they view this question of, of what are your goals? You know, we're in advising and they're talking, you know, how are we going to structure your curriculum and your, your extracurriculars and how are we going to get you prepared uh, for your career? Um, you know, when they say like, I'm going to be a vascular surgeon or something, I'm like, well, you like, why does, how did, you know, I, I think they don't think I'm going to do doctoring. That's not what they're thinking of, I'm on call, I'm sleeping in the hospital. I mean, it's labor, 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 the stress, 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 my cortisol levels are pathological. Um, that's not what they're thinking. They're thinking somebody is asking them at a banquet, what do you do for a living? And they're like, oh, I'm a neurosurgeon. Yeah, I, that's often what I find that, that, that people's motivation is. And so what I think is important is that it's the experience of what people are doing, that they connect with, they, they enjoy that job. It's the job itself, not in conversation. What right. do you do in conversation? It's the job itself. And like, I knew a lot of uh, people in pharmacy school and, and I had a lot of conversations with for a time. And I just thought this is weird because their, their motivation is so, it's just bizarre. I mean, they're going to be so miserable in life because not all of them, some of them are really interested in, you know, mm -hmm. pharmacology and, and essentially chemistry. But most of them told me about what cars they were going to buy first. Oh, like cars. Where? Like, like, like a G Tesla. wagon, the Glenel wagon or whatever the Mercedes, wow. like the Pope and Lil Wayne mobile. The, the students, the reason, I mean, reason number one that they reported why they were pursuing pharmacy as a career was to purchase cars like that you're gonna hate it being in the pharmacy yeah. you know in that setting putting in your 40 or whatever it is hours a week in the pharmacy if you don't like which that is more like 80 <laughs> which is probably more like 80 yeah like i mean at least if you're gonna be as, yeah as a faculty member it is it's, it's more like 80 um and, and i and i think it just keeps increasing. I think there's the brutalizing of faculty members to cotton ball the classrooms because we're ghost living the students' lives for them, essentially writing things on their behalf, escorting them every step of the way when they're totally capable of taking some of those steps on their own. Um, and so, so I think there's an amount of strain on, on the professor to eliminate the strain on the student. So you really have to enjoy that process if you want to put in 80 hours a week as a, as right. a professor um, and, and, and not constantly talk about work-life balance. And so I think finding the right motivation, finding a career that fits with people, and how do you do that? Um, a diverse experience, right? A, a nice liberal arts degree where you, all these weird, like arbitrary GEs that you take and see what you like and don't like, volunteer and intern and work in, in diverse settings to see if, well, it turns out I hate working with people or, or oh man, I need more human interaction. In my, to, to understand the the environmental factors that would go into an enjoyable work setting and and i think sort of travel and get um cultural diversity experience and and broaden exposures is how we come to know ourselves yeah. and and so like you know earlier I, I i think i talked about people who are you know if they're 14 and then they're 40 and they're the same person we have a problem right um and we have to come to know ourselves with experience. We can't just exist in isolation, desiring to be um, a neurosurgeon. You know, we really have to get to know ourselves and that's hard, it takes time. Yeah, I think a lot of times folks need to just sort of self-reflect and say, you know, okay, if I really like this, 
what do I need to do to step up my game? And so mm -hmm. there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of, I want this because of, because I think it will provide me that without fully appreciating what it actually takes from the perspective of someone who's actually done it. Like if I want to actually be a neurosurgeon, as an example, folks have to really, I think, come to terms with what is it, what is not, what is it that I think it should take, right? Which is kind of connecting in the, the mm -hmm. uh, cotton balling of the classroom, right? Not what the student thinks it should take to be a neurosurgeon, but what the demands and what the hospital and what the environment actually expects and demands of you in order to be a good neurosurgeon. And if right. there's a disconnect between what you expect and what is expected in actuality from the job, there's going to be friction there, right? <laughs> and and people are going to want to change careers or they're going to say they don't feel fulfilled or I don't feel valued is a big thing that people are saying, right? I don't feel valued. I don't feel appreciated. I don't feel that I'm getting paid what I'm worth. You know, all of these types of things is really, I think, a, a line for trying to help people get a life that is filled with fulfillment that um, hopefully can extend beyond, you know, your legacy can extend beyond our own mortality in life. Can, can we take another sidetrack of the importance of difficulty and the importance of a good mentor? Um, and so that I would get into my master's program um, to, to talk about these things in yes. route to the PhD. And we'll talk about PhD in just a second. But in my undergrad, I had um, Julie Abendroth was her name. She was a biomechanist. I'm sure I've talked about her before. The most important person in shaping my academic life. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know what I want. You know, I, again, I had this idea when I was in my undergrad of human performance, um, bodybuilding and back pain. You know, what do I do with it? But I didn't really know that, that opens 50 million careers, you know, like, what are you going to do with that? And so I just had this vague idea of a direction that I wanted to go. And she said, I have a grad school that I work for you. It doesn't really equip you for anything specific. It's more exploration in that direction. Um, and it's about 600 miles south. I'd actually never even heard of the university at the time. Um, but, you know, University of the Pacific, right, where I work now, that's where I did my master's. And it's about 600 miles south of, of Willamette. And she set me up with an assistantship there. She knew people. She's like, all right, I'm going to get you an assistantship. We're gonna... But there's a Pacific University in Oregon that was like an hour from me. And so that's where I thought at first. She's like, no, 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 it's a different one. I'm like, well, where is it? And this is like before GPS cell phones and stuff. So I could just start driving south. And so <laughs> my career idea was like, you know what? I know I want to work in, in healthcare, health sciences, you know, physiology, exercise, science, you know, something. I have something in mind. And so I'm going to vaguely move in that direction. And it was just like vaguely driving down to Pacific where like, I know it's south on I-5. I'll just keep going there and, I, and maybe I'll you know, figure it out on the way. Um, but then when I got to uh, Pacific, uh, it was, I had an assistantship, um, but it was $8,000 a year. Wow. But full full tuition. Uh, full, 12 like, months no, or nine months or 10? Uh, over, over nine months. Um, nine months. But it was $8,000. And California, even then, really expensive. Wow. Really expensive. And it was $8,000. And so my first year was, oh, it's hard. Um, and so my second year, I decided, you know what, I'm just going to be homeless for the whole year, uh, for the academic year. So like nine months, I mean, I'm just going to, I'm going to be homeless. And I made this commitment to myself that I'm going to get clear through um, the two semesters. And that was the, that's really what I took away. Um, the two biggest lessons that I got from my master's came from the difficulty of homelessness and the perks that came. So the first lesson from, from my master's degree is how to do homelessness. Uh, Cause I was really, they remember I talked about Eric Clapton being terrible at guitar at first yeah. and you, whatever, you know, you're Picasso when you're horrible at art and stuff. Um, and then you get better and better and better. I was like, I, I, I'm getting caught by custodians. You know, I, I got trapped on a roof once. Um, you know, so it didn't go well at first, but by the end of my nine months, I was really good at homelessness. And that paid dividends when I got to, or eventually uh, when, I, when I was at UConn, that, that sort of paid off well for me, as you, as you know, and we may talk about in a minute. But the other benefit of, of that, of, of being homeless, was $8,000 in nine months is actually a lot of money if you have no bills. I didn't have rent. I didn't have a cell phone. I didn't have a car. I didn't even have health insurance. You know, $8,000 is a lot of money. And so with those funds, I got a lot of stamps on my passport, um, you know, around the time of graduation. 
I actually left early and then came back to do my comps. Um, I gave up on my thesis and left early and came back to do comps after traveling. And one of those trips was to Cameroon. It was my first trip to Africa. Um, more to follow but my first one was to Cameroon and it was a medical mission and I was you know a surgical assistant and and I was doing clinical and that's where I learned that I don't actually want to do the clinical side like I, it was really rewarding and I loved it and one of the most yeah. memorable experiences I've ever had but I that's not the clinical side what I want to do is get into the academic side I want to have conversations and learning and and I don't know what like the, the satisfaction of new neuronal connections or, or something like oh whoa you, you know like learning something interesting you get excited and that yeah. excitement I was not experiencing in the clinic I was experiencing uh, um understanding of what this type of job might look like. And I realized it wasn't for me. And so I moved more into the academic side. And then I went back to Julie Abendroth and I said like, all right, I, I, now I got to figure out what to do with my life. I think it's more academics. And that year, ACSM was in uh, Seattle. And so it's like, all right, we're going to ACSM. We're going to pick you out a PhD program. So, you know, got in her car, drove down to, or up, I guess it was, to Seattle. And um, from Oregon, I, from Oregon, from Oregon, or from, yeah, University from, from Oregon. So, so yeah, she was okay. a professor at, at Willamette. Um, and I, I came back to Oregon after Pacific and I worked for a little while and I yeah. wasn't enjoying that. Um, and I, we, so we went to ACSM and I'm like, I can't even afford, you know, to get in. It's like, it's super expensive. Uh, I'm not currently a student and I don't have any money. And, and she's like, oh, I'll get you a badge. Don't worry. Um, and so she got this badge of somebody who paid, who wasn't going to be there. She knows them. It's a biomechanist. And apparently the guy like, worked on Golem, like digitizing Golem in Lord of the Rings or something. Cause I was wearing the badge normally and people recognized it. And I started wearing the badge backwards. You know, it's like, oh, it just got tangled up. And Julie picked out three different PhD programs that had different, um, you know, research opportunities, different structure, stuff like that. And it was University of Oregon, University of Florida, and UConn. And, and, and she helped me set up these meetings with people at each uh, university, you know, dinners and, and things like that. And eventually, after meeting everybody, I decided on UConn. Um, and then finally, you know, I, I went out to UConn and started that program. And what I think is so important about a PhD experience, for people who want to go into the academic um, side, not clinical care, not, um, you know, MD, DO, DPT, OT, whatever, you know, not clinical care, but getting into pure academics, what the university system is so good for is exposure to the environment, because you can read infinity journal articles. And I was doing that. I still do it. You still do it. You just, in your spare time, you're reading journal articles and you can just find that like most of them are open access. You know, if you're part of a university, you're going to have subscriptions that allow you uh, additional um, journals to get the full articles from. But I mean, from the time you learn to read until you're in hospice, right? You can read journal articles for free every moment of your life. And so education is accessible to everyone. But what you can't learn um, is the structure of a university, um, how to integrate into that sort of community. Um, you can't learn how research works um, from, you know, devising a research question, data collection, analysis, everything through, you know, publication and dissemination of that information. You can't really learn that stuff at home. And, and I think especially integrating into that community is so important. Um, in part, the relationships you develop. I mean, it was 10 years ago or something like that. It was at least a decade ago. I was there 2010. And <laughs> the reason why I know that is I, gra I was supposed to graduate in 2009. And I was doing my internship in the summer of 2010 when you and I met at ACSM in Baltimore. And, that was a good um, trip. That was a good trip. And um, I'll never forget what you told me, which was you knew that I was going to be someone that was going to be good to work with because we were going to some Italian restaurant and we were walking in the heat and I was in a suit and it was probably as hot as it is here in Philadelphia, probably upper 90s super hot and I was just struggling through it 
and it was, uh, you know, I will do what is necessary to make this project successful, right? And that doesn't. Yeah, mean, and I remember you had just no finished, sleep. like, see, you had what? What was the digital equivalent of like the dog ate my homework? That you had, you had like a hard drive crash or something like oh, that. Oh yes. And you had to like stay up all night the night. Right? You didn't make an excuse. I think the professor didn't even know, and you right. just like, you know, I'm just gonna stay up all night and and try to rewrite this thing. Nobody needs to know, and that sort of work ethic of there's no excuse like enough with everyone's excuses of why they didn't finish things like i'm so sick of excuses and you never made an excuse about anything ever and i could just tell that discipline the commitment to the outcome where it's like all right i'm gonna do this i know there's follow-through and so it was obvious that you were going to go be successful in yeah. whatever the pursuit was it was just a matter of landing in the right direction which you found i want to make sure we get to seattle and when you interviewed you went to yukon but so you're homeless in Stockton, which is where the University of the Pacific is. Right. You reconnect with Julie and you say, well, I think I'm going to go for my PhD or I know at least I want to work in the academic arena. Mm -hmm. And so how do we make that happen? And so then she just picks you up on I-5 or how, how, um, I, how does that I, work? We continue to have a very close relationship. Um, and so I would always, I was just in touch with her, you know, when I was doing my master's, we would exchange emails. Um, when I moved back, we were constantly in touch, we would go running together. Um, and so she was just my mentor, she was my academic mentor. And she, mm -hmm. she served that role in my undergrad, and it didn't end because she was a true academic, a true teacher, right, who, who cares about the full development, the full maturity, not like, all right, you graduated next. Um, it yeah. wasn't that and, and it wasn't just I wasn't unique. She did that for people. Um, and so that's what she did for like my my friend Travis. Um, I think you met Travis, Travis Styles. He's the president um, and founder of Novaron. It's a biochemistry uh, company with tons of funding coming in it's in San Diego. Um, and he did. Um, Julie was his mentor who kind of escorted gotcha. him along um, his path to him. So she just did that for people. Um, so even though I graduated years ago, I mean, I, I, at this point, I had a master's degree from a totally different institution she's unaffiliated with. And she still took me to ACSM to say, now we got to figure out what's next. Um, right. And then and then that's when we um, decided on UConn. Gotcha. Um, and I went and did that like week long interview. Uh, at, so this uh, isn't, this must be what, in 2009, Seattle? 2009. Then, yeah, it was, it was a 2009 ACSM. Because I believe um, you started, you started at UConn. January 10. I was going to say you were non non traditional enrolling, yeah. which is, you know, not in the fall. You started in the mm -hmm. spring term. And so you moved in January of 2010 to stores. And I, think you drove cross country i drove my dad and i we took <laughs> shifts because it was we left on january 1st at like 5 a.m and salem we, we left from salem oregon that's where i was living at the time my, my parents live in silverton which is maybe 40 minutes away something like that so actually so i drove out to my parents house at a little ford focus and I, I drove it out to my parents house with very little in the car um uh, because my dad and i were going to be taking shifts um and my dad is, he was a, for 10 years to the day, he quit on his 10th anniversary. He was a truck driver and, and his dad before him was a truck driver. And they, they, they were truckers for the same outfit at the same time. They're mm -hmm. my dad and grandpa were on their CBs and, you know, they talking to each other on the road and stuff. And so my dad is the, and he's a machinist today. Still, he's a machinist. Um, and he does a lot of like performance engines, things like that. And I don't really understand. Like I bored and stroked it out to, to 383. You know, I don't really understand what he's talking about, but he's passionate about it. He loves it. And he's done a lot of like race car engines and stuff. Um, and it, that's why he still does it. There's no work-life balance for my dad. He <laughs> found what he loves, um, but he's this phenomenal driver. And it was, it was January 1st. It was going to be snowy the entire way. I'm like, ah, I'm, I'm not. You know, I'm not going to drive the whole way in a Ford Focus, like a two wheel drive Ford Focus. And so my dad and I were taking shifts and, um, but I didn't have much. I didn't bring much, um, to, to Yukon. And so, so we drove for whatever, six, seven days, something like that, um, in the snow, the entire, I mean, within an hour of leaving Silverton, something like that, we were already in the snow. It, gotcha. just, it was just snowy when we got there. Um, but yeah, then got to Yukon and started to integrate at that point. Um, and I mean, as you know, from your experience at UConn and from your PhD, there are ups and downs in, yeah. a, in, a, in a graduate school, and weirds. There are ups and downs and weirds um, in, a, in a doctoral program. And it's important to 
acknowledge and accept and make the most of all of those. Yeah. Um, <laughs> can we talk about some of the weirds? <laughs> Okay. Um, so I remember, you know, my, my first advisor, phenomenal researcher, I'm not going to name, you know, particular, uh, people, um, but, but like there, there was this phenomenal respected, highly successful researcher that I was working with that our personalities clashed. We didn't mm -hmm. get along. Um, and we started to figure that out after about a year <laughs> or so, not right away, uh, but it took a little time to figure out that like, we really, this is not clicking. Um, and I remember um, sitting in that person's office and then Kramer walks by and, oh man, I love Kramer. And so I would sit in on, on Kramer's classes, um, whatever he was teaching. I was just sitting, it was like watching a podcast. Even um, if you weren't enrolled. Even if I wasn't enrolled, yeah, because I, I did that to Armstrong. I did it to, I mean, I just did that to a bunch of classes because, like, I didn't have a TV. Um, my TV shows were lectures, and, like, what better source of information than these, like, nationally, sometimes internationally renowned professors mm -hmm. giving lectures on topics that interest me. So I'm just going to go sit in the back of the classroom. And then, you know, it was uh, kind of well into the semester. You could still enroll, but... Um, Kramer pokes his head in the office and sees me sitting there. And then he says, you know, if you're going to show up to every single one of my classes, you should just enroll. And he didn't know that that would create like a two week tense, like impasse between my advisor and me who uh, it, it, it's a, there's, but there was lots of weird things. Um, so oh, I learned. The, so the issue was that the advisor didn't know that you were going didn't to know that classes. I was in there because wouldn't have approved it. Um, wouldn't have approved it. Oh, so it outward, wasn't even outwardly would have blocked oh, it if I, if I tried to do it. And I so you. I was sneaking. I, I was, I was thought I was being sneaky and I was sitting in the back of the classroom riveted by the information. I mean, I, I was every day I was leaving with 10 pages of notes, but I wasn't enrolled. So it'd be like the equivalent of the usher at the opera that, uh, you know, is supposed to just make sure people get to their seats. Okay. And that's your job. And the equivalent of the lecturer was the performer and you were sneaking in to watch the opera when they thought you I'm should be doing other sneaking things. in to watch the opera. That's okay. good. Gotcha. Um, and I loved it. And I don't know how many, we were a few weeks in or something like yeah. that, but, but he just said it casually. He didn't know that this would cause tension um, that I wasn't really allowed to, to do that. Um, but yeah, just, you know, if you're going to come to every single lecture, you might as well just register. And then he kind of like nods to, you know, walks off. And, and I did end up registering. It did create additional tension between my advisor and me. Um, but, you know, again, I can really respect that advisor for the accomplishments yeah. um, that, that were done. And I learned a lot about ACSM, which I'm now highly involved in. I don't mm -hmm. know how many apps. I have 10 more abstracts in this last one that haven't been come out in MSSE yet, but I had 10 more students um, present at the, at the most recent, I don't know how many, 120 or whatever it is total, um, AC, national ACSM abstracts that I've led students to. And so I kind of learned how to do that um, at, at UConn. I would have never known how, to, how these steps worked. Um, but there were some weird times too. Like there was one presentation that I had at I don't know if it was an HIV project or one of those um, cholesterol and mental health projects or something like that, but I, I had graphs and it was males and females. And I, originally I, you know, in my, in my PowerPoint presentation, I had one of those 15 minute talks and, and um, I had men as like teal color, you know, for the you know, bar graph and women were I, like magenta or something like that. And uh, the advisor was like, no, 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 you can't, you can't do that. It, it went through all these series of, of revisions. And then I just, I'm just doing whatever I'm told. And by the end, I don't know how we got here, but men were Barbie pink and, and women were Ken blue. And I give this presentation and everyone in the audience is so confused. And I'm like, oh, I'm confused too. I, I, and now maybe in retrospect, there, that was yeah. progressive based on where we are today and gender identity and, and making sure where, maybe that was progressive. But at that time, it was just confusing. And like everyone was, was good. And we're like, you remember when, um, I, I think it was, and by the way, thanks for all those like, you know, jackets and suits. I, mean, I, was, I was always wearing your clothes. I just didn't have the clothes. And yeah. so oh, I got to look professional for this. And so I was always wearing your clothes. Um, but I, I think it was Indianapolis, which I ended up living in later, mm. um, where it, the edits, the revisions were going back and forth for so long for this, for this poster. I remember this. 
yeah, yeah. that like I couldn't even print it until we were in Indiana. I'm like, okay, I present in like 12 hours or something. I, I got to like find a Kinko's or whatever, you know, to print this thing. And I have a flash drive with me on site. And so I printed it on what I had asked, like, <laughs> like you still have a picture of this, like newsprint. It, it was the cheapest paper that was like right. great. It looked like an original Game Boy screen background, that color. And it was like thin and and in black and white. <laughs> you have I a remember picture. that. Because well, Kinko's yeah. is like 120 bucks if you want same day service at the time. Yeah, I think they, that's what it was. I'm like, I can afford this. But, um, but the funny part of this stuff is I take it that the advisor didn't know that you're going to be printing it in black and white either. I don't think the advisor knew anything about it. It was just a matter of like, I don't approve this yet. But then I, I, I looked, I eventually went back to the first draft and the final draft of some of this stuff. Sometimes it was an abstract that went back and forth for three months, whatever. And there's like nine words that are different because what would happen is, um, you know, I would do 20 drafts on my own and then I'd sort of submit it for ex for revisions and and then revisions would come back. I'd make them, I'd send it back. More revisions come back, right. I'd submit it. More revisions, but some of those third revisions were reverting the first revisions back to the original state. You know, and, like, and so it, we went through like 30 something drafts and the final was remarkably similar to the first draft. And it doesn't need to be like that. You know, what, what it can be is like, all right, let's sit down for an hour and I'm going to explain to you why this changes and that changes and why you can't say this and you should say that. Um, and within an hour, we're totally done. But that wasn't the experience I had. There's a book that came out when I was a student, uh, when we were there together, I think. Tina Fey, you know, from SNL, she wrote that book, Bossy Pants. And I was reading it, I was listening, it was audible. I was, I was audibling it on my commutes, either to campus and back walking or driving to the work site, to the data collection site. And there was this line where she quotes Lorne Michaels uh, from SNL saying, like, how do you run a successful show? And his line was, I hire talented people and I get out of their way. That's that's good advice, you know, and it just wasn't the experience I was having. Um, I and again, I can really admire this person for um, such a successful career and such a hard worker and really committed, but I wasn't having that kind of experience. So, so for me, the last straw was I did comprehensive exams. You know, for people who don't know, for people who aren't haven't done a PhD or something like that, you do comprehensive exams, and then you move into full-time dissertation. Um, so at the end of all of your coursework, for me, it was after three and a half years, after seven semesters, is comprehensive exams, and then move into um, full-time dissertation, and then you defend that, you know, whatever, a year and a half later or something. Um, so for the context, so I did that. And one of my comprehensive exam uh, professors was Craig Deniger, who, oh, I love that person so much. Um, I mean, if I were to make a list of you know the top 10 people who i just adore bruno you're on that list oh, craig great. deniger is on that list oh i love this guy i mean i haven't talked to him in 10 years but but that doesn't matter you know it doesn't my, my affection and my and my appreciation for for him does not change so i did a comprehensive exam answer for him and it was about statistics because i one of my stats uh, classes was from him and the best stats class i ever took was from deniger so good so I, he gave me a comprehensive exam answer about statistics and research methods and, and research theory and stuff like that. And I submitted it. I did my you know question and submitted it. And he came up to me afterward, after reading it, and said, I want to publish this. ACSM is doing a book, you know, re the ACSM's research methods, whatever it's called. And he's like, I've been asked to do chapter six. And he's like, this is 90% of what you wrote is ready for the chapter. And he's like, I need to add some stuff in there. And, and we need to take away about 10% of what you wrote because you write with such color. <laughs> you know, there's, there's too much flavor in, in, in some of that, the analogies and stuff. So let's take, get rid of some of that. But he's like, the bulk of your work is done. He's like, I just need to do my part. I'm like, oh, that's great. Like I, I get this publication in this, in this chapter. And I was so excited, you know, and because I didn't have anything like this on my resume. And mm. so I went to tell my advisor and put an absolute block to it and said, as long as you're in my lab, you cannot collaborate um, with anybody else. Pretty close to an exact quotation. Wow. And it was weird because it's like, I, my work is done. Like I, I, this coming weekend, maybe I'll spend a couple of hours, but my contribution is done and I get a publication. And, and so I tried to defend myself a little bit. And then there was just absolutely not. Mm -hmm. um, those words were spoken. And so I left the office and I went down to Deniker's office 
and I explained the situation and he said, yeah, we're publishing it. I, let's, let's get you out of this situation. It's not right for you. And so then I, I, I set about switching advisors. I switched to Deniger. The problem with doing that, it was one of the greatest decisions of my life was to switch to Deniger. Because again, I hold great admiration for my former advisor um, in the accomplishments um, in her work ethic, she's one of the hardest working people I've ever met. And in her ability to connect with particular students, we just didn't click, <laughs> you know, and that's okay. Um, for anybody sure. watching, if you, if you're an aspiring, you know, PhD student and you encounter a situation where it's like, this is like a great person that's not for me, that's totally fine. It's not about you. Um, it's about finding what is right for you. And so what was right for me was Deniger. And so I switched. Ooh, as soon as I did, I gave up my assistantship, right? I had this full assistantship. And so now I have no money coming in and I still have to be there for a while. And this is earlier, an hour ago or whatever, when I, when I said one of the great lessons I learned from my master's program was how to be homeless. That's what I, I had to do it at Pacific or at, um, at UConn for a while. And I'm sure there's like a statute of limitations on trespassing and I'm sure it's up. I'm not sure actually. But so I just slept in Holly Armory where the, where the phone booth came from for at least, I think maybe just a semester. Um, but I was really good at it um, at that point. I mean, I, I knew everyone's schedules. Um, I knew exactly when everyone was coming and going. Um, I mean, I just, I, you do the reconnaissance work. I knew where to park my car in the day, where to park my car at night. Um, and it was always moving. I knew everyone when they were coming and going from the military folks to um, other offices in the building. To, I, I knew what I, but I had no business being there. I mean, I really, I wasn't even a part of that lab and I was still living in that, in that building. And so the homelessness did pay off. And then from there, I moved to Indiana for my uh, dissertation because I was collaborating with a hospital because I had to give up my former data collection. You know, what we did together with, mm -hmm. in part an HIV project, in part uh, non-HIV um, substance abuse project. I mean, oh, I did data collection for like three and a half years and I didn't get to use that data anymore, that, those data, remember that database. And so I moved to Indiana to collaborate with the hospital and I was living there for a while. From there, I moved to Chicago and, and we, I ended up publishing two papers off of that dissertation. And that's really what-, what Now this, this work was in alignment with the new advisor, then mm -hmm. Yeah, because I really changed my focus to like biostatistics. And so under his wing, that's really what I uh, was moving into. And kind of epidemiological analyses, uh, sort of larger samples, not entire, you know, like public health populations, but in the hospital setting, an entire patient registry of thousands of patients. Um, how do you statistically handle um, those populations and control for possible um, confounders and, and extract? Wow. Um, meaningful prescriptive information. And so my dissertation ended up being on rib fractures, which I kind of knew nothing about going in, but I read every single paper. I even got mm. these papers. I think Dittman was the author. They were only published in German and I was using a Google translator to put them in English. And so international papers that weren't even in English. I read those ones too. And that's getting into this difference between PhD and MD. I read every single publication at that time ever published in any language in a reputable journal on this subject. And I came to know it really well. Um, and both the papers came out in pain medicine um, during my, I don't know, first semester or something like that when I was a professor at, at Pacific. And I think that's the importance of being a PhD is I, I'm not, you know, an emergency medicine doctor. I'm not an orthopedist. I'm not, you know, whatever it is where we're working with rib fractures. I'm not that, but I read every single paper ever published and I was able to come up with uh, prescriptive information. And I, I can do that with these different topics. I'm uh, one of my current topics is fall risk. And I'm still working with this hospital. It was a profitable collaboration. We just did this paper that was submitted um, are we accurate in our initial assessment, right? Is this over triage or under triage? How are we, how accurate are we in our, in first blush assessments? And so that's what the most recent paper is. And like, I don't, I'm not a doctor, you know, I don't, I don't work in that field, but I can read the papers. I can run the statistics and, and I can gotcha. um, contribute to the field. And so that's what I think PhDs are so valuable for. It's not taking the information that currently exists and saying, that's it forever. We're never going to get better. No one's ever going to learn anything new. Prescriptions and, and, and therapies are static for eternity. It's let's take what we know and advance it. 
that's what's so important yeah. gotcha. um, about about especially I think collaborations with PhDs and MDs and the MDs I work for are really that I work with uh, um, in in statistics um, and and analyses are really good. They're really good out there. Well, I mean, I'll I'll, that, see yeah. on the research end. But I guess you know, coming coming full circle with everything a little bit is some people go the route of like biostat major NIH R1 type institution. Some folks go more um, smaller school teaching very heavily and some do like a hybrid of both. Mm -hmm. And I guess you have really done a good job of not, I guess you have done a really good job in taking your journey that's woven through homelessness to bachelor's muffins, which is a completely different story <laughs> to, you know, coming full, coming full circle and having this PhD in a world renowned kinesiology program. And you ended up having 120 ish ACSM national abstract. So can you talk a little bit about the undergrad research experience and how you have been able to do this with a, what I know is a fairly high teaching load with four new courses that you've developed. Um, one of, one of which you've flown across the country last year and presented at mid Atlantic conference for us and talked a lot. It was very, side. it was very well received uh, that discussion. There's people in the back of the room that loved and, you know, the quote was that, you know, Courtney Jensen stole the show type of thing. And that's pretty high words when um, GAB, George Brooks, was getting ready to take the stage as a keynote after you. So I think, can you talk a bit about how you came up with the idea and were able to produce that many abstracts with such a high teaching load? And the reason why I bring that up is because at Drexel, we're in the process of developing an undergraduate research program. We have 500 undergrads in our program and we piloted it this summer. And my goodness, it's a, it's a lot of work to keep up with all those projects. How did you as one faculty member be able to generate that many abstracts of that quality? Like, how did you create the culture for it? And how, how did you have time to get all that done? Uh, at that time, I was working, so I was on campus. Um, I've always lived in proximity to campus, walking distance. I've never, I haven't owned a car since I've been um, living in Stockton. Um, cause I just haven't had to drive, you know, I've, I, um, I've always been in, in walking distance. And so uh, I, at that time I was probably spending 14 hours a day, seven days a week on campus. <clears throat> um, and you know, Christmas day, maybe I'd only work 10 hours. Um, but again, th this comes at a time where I was really connecting with, um, what I was doing and I was enjoying it. So it didn't seem like overexertion. So two of the courses I, I developed were physiology. One of them is muscle physiology and the other one's stress physiology, yeah. um, which are really, that's, if anyone were talking about like a wheelhouse, you know, that's sort of where I am with, with my, my physiological interests and, and information consumption. And, um, but on, on the other side, the two co uh, courses I developed were epidemiology and research methods in the, you know, I don't remember. It's a really long title, that, that course, like, research and health and exercise science. I honestly, I don't even know the name of the, of the course I invented and, and got into the curriculum. Um, because like those four courses didn't exist before I came. And the two research courses, um, epidemiology, I don't spend much time talking mm -hmm. about basic proper epidemiology, um, you know, viral vectors and what, you know, stuff like that. Um, I mean, I, I might give 10 minutes to COVID. You know, and the, when people are teaching epidemiology in the age of COVID, they, they might spend weeks you know, talking about that. <laughs> I'm like, all right, let's give it 10 minutes because I want to get into statistics and how to handle data. Data are everywhere. You know, you're working for Walmart, you're working for a hospital, you're, you're, at, you're working in athletics, wherever yeah. you are, data are abundant. How do you make use of it? And so I, I begin the class, you know, just talking about the, the history of, of research and, and statistics and how we've come to know what we know. And here's what epidemiology is and the basic um, epidemiological models, you know, things like that. 
and then I spend more than two thirds of the, of the semester straight statistics and, and everyone has SPSS. That's what we use. So every student has it. Every student needs to do a research project. I can usually in a semester, I can usually get at least one, sometimes two of those projects into ACSM. It's a lot of work. And then um, I, the other class is the best students who, who do um, epidemiology, they have to get through epidemiology first, those best students, maybe we didn't publish what they were doing, it was just a demonstration of their ability to understand, everyone has to present their work, and um, they, they're they eligible to take the research class, and that's more of a one-on-one, -on -one where the lectures I give might be 15 minutes long, and then it's one-on-one, -on -one. Um, and we're just trying to get research projects together, and I might only have 10 students in that class, something like that, but uh, yeah, if, if it's just me, by myself, you know, just, all right, let me analyze and write these things up. That takes maybe a quarter of the time of getting a student <laughs> in there because it ends up being, you know, they're, they're not ready to write the, the abstracts. They, they don't, the sentence, you know, construction, the statistics maybe. And so what it is, I ask them to try and they try. If they don't try, we're not even going to move forward. Um, but I ask them to try. <clears throat> they try. We sit together, and I revise a sentence and explain how I did it. You know, I revise the next sentence and explain how I did it. Then, you know, like, I want you to go try the next section. They go try. I revise a sentence and explain how I did it. it, it so it's a, it's a matter of, of instruction, really, sure. um, the whole way through. And my goal is, is um, and I've done this with a couple of students, where the first abstract they put in a ton of time, but not one keystroke belongs to them. Um, the second year that, that they go, they're, they're able to contribute more. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I had one student so far, one student I, I had, he's a, he became a phenomenal statistician, um, had a little bit more to go on the writing, but his statistics, phenomenal. I mean, he finished his undergrad and master's with me, and I want him to go into a PhD program. <laughs> you know, he's, he has a job that makes probably more than I do, and so he's he's probably not, e and he owns his own house down the street, nice house, and so he's probably not eager to, to give up that life to go be a poor college student again, but he's such a good statistician but um i had another student her name was um cynthia villalobos we ended up hiring her she did her undergrad i was her advisor in her undergrad and her advisor in her master's <clears throat> and then we hired her to teach uh, exercise physiology just the undergraduate introduction to exercise physiology course and she did a phenomenal job there and we continue to work together and so so far she's the only student who's ever i put her on her own i'm like all right you have to do one on your own this year i'm not touching it and she went through the process of her own data. She collaborated with her own hospital because um, a lot of what we do is hospital data, you know, big uh, databases. And she collaborated with her own, she established her own connection at a hospital, got her own database, cleaned up that data by herself, ran, ran the analyses by herself, wrote the abstract by herself. And all, she, all I would do, she would bring it to me and say, did I do this right? And I would just say yes or no. And that was it. And it was like after the, you know, after the data cleaning, did I clean this right? Do you see any errors? I don't see errors. Or like, I see an error, find it. You know, I don't even like tell her where it is. You know, And so it, it was just this, that I was serving a validation role in that one. So far, that's the only person I've, I've gotten to do gotcha. um, where she can do it solo. The tragedy here, and I'm like holding back tears now, is she had a massive stroke. Um, oh my goodness. And so she got into her PhD and she got in everywhere. Uh, so... Brown accepted her. You know, Brown flew her out. Brown paid for everything. Um, I think so. Cynthia and I did like thirty abstracts together um, at ACSM because she was helping me. Because I can't oversee every single, you know, keystroke of every single student and every single right. email. And so she was my sidekick. Um, and you know, in her last year of her master's and the you know year and a half or whatever that, that we kind of held on to her afterward, uh, where she continued to do research with me. But she ended up um, accepting a Davis because of their program was was so aligned with um, with her. And then like a month before she was supposed to go, um, it just she's alive today. But um, and making really remarkable. So they were considering pulling the plug. I mean, this is just this podcast just took a turn for a very yeah. different emotion. But um, she had no brain activity at all. Wow. Um, you know, they're running these, you know, MRIs and they're like, none. And today we text back and forth. 
it, it was it was the, it's a like if anything if i have ever witnessed a miracle that's the one and so my goal is to someday reincorporate her into the into the research um, process um, but she has a lot of therapy sure. and healing um, ahead of yeah. her but it's been a, a massive undertaking Can I, so one of the so like to put it into perspective it's a full-time job year round and and you know it's one year i had like 33 or something like that and again if it was just me by myself it wouldn't have been as much work but but to take a student who doesn't understand and and mm -hmm every keystroke of the way, every analysis of the way. So you like, watch me what I'm doing and I, I need you to understand what, what it is we're doing. And I have them practice presenting. I mean, it's, it is labor to get one student to do this. And so I was putting in probably 30 hours a week for maybe seven months of the year leading up to ACSM. And the problem though, is my university didn't really get it. Now, people at my university got it, researchers at my university got it, but when you get 20 or 30 abstracts accepted somewhere, the impression is that it's auto-accept in their little projects. Like, that's not true. They right. have no idea the labor that I put in here. I mean, I was putting in more hours into overseeing student research than probably half the faculty were putting in entirely into their jobs at Pacific. And, and that understanding, I think, was missed by, by a lot of people. It was so intense. So these days, I, 10, I'm going to do 10. You know, uh, last year, I did eight at ACSM and two at experimental biology. Gotcha. I um, had students, uh, those projects uh, presented. But I, my goal now is just 10 because it's so emotionally and sure. physically consuming to do that. So none of these projects are actually designed by the student or you, you're pretty much, is it mostly secondary data analysis of existing data sets that you're not actually having them go through the process of consenting somebody and there's there are time some, for that. Yeah, there are some that we do that. I work with I'm not paid by them. I've never made a dime from this company, nothing like that. But Proteus mm -hmm. is a biomechanics company. It's uh, and and we were the first university to get one placed. And I met the CEO, his name is Sam. I mean, like before they even had the model developed. I flew out to New York to meet with them and see the prototype well before the, the machine was really designed and, and marketed. Um, I was in, I was involved with the company because I saw the potential in it. And then I just kept, you know, I was in there at some of their promotional materials of, of using the prototype and talking about um, what it might be used for. And then they got the funding, they built this thing. It's an amazing machine. This thing's amazing. And so then we ended up getting one for pretty close to like at cost at the university. And we've been actively collecting data on that and publishing, but it's, it's sort of biomechanics and human performance is really what that machine is for. So, um, and it spits out just, I mean, huge data sets. So would you recommend based off your experiences working 14 hours a day, seven days a week and 10, nope. 10 hours a day on Christmas? <laughs> Nope. Would you recommend um, doing mostly secondary data analysis if you can, if you know, to give, do you, you know, do you feel students are missing any type of experiences? Like we've tried to have uh, a few of the students, what we did for the undergrad program is we had, um, you know, the students would be involved and I pick three projects like that, you know, we have ongoing where I know they're, you know, IRB approved and getting them on the IRB process and then letting them have some opportunity to collect some data as part of that project. Um, and then, you know, unfortunately you're not in, in a 10 week quarter system, you're not necessarily going to have enough data to do an abstract, but that's where, you know, previous data that hasn't yet been presented or published that's been done in the past, it's de-identified, you know, that, that type of situation is where we have them statistically analyze that to try and get their abstracts together. Um, but, you know, just in terms of timeline, would you recommend it's better to have these data sets continuously ready to go because the timeline and, you know, the coaching curve of getting an actual project from idea inception through publication or presentation, you know, that might, that's just not feasible in a 10 week timeline. So having sec having data sets where, you know, you can come up with a question based off of this data that already exists. And then they're having more of a, I guess, a biostat experience 
right? Where they're learning a lot about the data mm-hmm. and they're understanding how it works. Um, but some students, like you said, two projects a year or so actually go through the process of getting the IRB and collecting the data and doing all of it, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there were, I think two IRBs last year. So I have a massive overarching IRB because the IRB at Pacific got sick of me because I have all these different projects I'm working on. And am I going to submit, you know, how many different hospitals and, and clinics and institutions am I working with with data? I don't know, 15 or something. So I'm running 15 different IRBs. And so I start submitting these IRBs like, whoa, 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 whoa this is crazy. We can't review all of these. Can you just make one? Like, of course I can just make one. So I have a single IRB in place, which includes patients in any hospitals. type of setting. It could be hospitals, outpatient, you know, PT, whatever. Patients, collegiate athletes. Um, so at the in a university system. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it includes like de-identified laboratory data. So everything has to be de-identified. Yeah. Uh, that's the condition. But I have three different populations that I can draw from and it's all a single IRB and I just put students I mean there I must have like 150 students on that IRB (laughs) and so it but it it really streamlines the process as opposed to and aside from that maybe I've had 10 IRBs something like that one of the um, data sets uh, that I use you know I've I've been to um, Uganda a couple of times and um, I work with what's called the Uganda Bureau of Statistics it's the equivalent of the U.S. Census Bureau it's in this building called Statistics House (laughs) so you take this elevator up that I prefer to take the stairs because I'm sure the elevator is going to break but you go up to like a sixth floor or something like that and there's all these great statisticians I mean everyone in the room has at least a master's degree in statistics really smart people there and I I work with them on on analyzing massive epidemiological data for Uganda, and you find fascinating things because it's so dissimilar to the U.S. So, so you know, something like that um, would be one outlet where you can ask that data set ten different questions. I mean, there's so much data. There's hemoglobin in there. I mean, there's like everything in there. The altitude that people live, um, how far it is to get water. I mean, there's a thousand questions in here. And so all you do is look at all the variables and say, all right, what question am I going to ask this oracle? And then you statistically ask the oracle a question and you get your answer. And and you can you can ask it so many questions. Um, and so, so many research projects can come from that. Gotcha. Gotcha. That's helpful. No, because you know, when we think about how we're going to scale these types of things, part of it is like, well, how do we use our existing class? We have a research methods class, then we have a stat class, and then there's an applied research, which we call the cure course-based undergrad research experience. Um, And so the cure is designed for, you've already done methods, you understand the designs, you've been examined on that. The stats is more of the applied, right? Picking Picking the right tool to answer the right question based off the design. And then the applied is more like, all right, roll up your sleeves. Now you're actually going to do it. And, Mm -hmm. and the end product has to be, you know, presenting or getting an abstract submitted or they want, they want to publish something, you know, some, something along those lines, but there needs to be the, the goal is to have some type of end product. And we have about, about 10 students in the class as well. So it's about similar size, but I wasn't sure in terms of if these abstracts were, you know, if it's possible, just sit there and keep track of all these projects and collect data. It just seems like that'd be, that's a full-time job in and of itself. I know. Yeah. It's already a full-time job as is. That would be like two full-time <laughs> jobs. And I just, I wouldn't be able to oversee it, you know, not, not with the uh, sort of resources I have. There's no way I could, I could. So, you know, at this point I I have a, an effort ceiling that's sort of, that if I Kinda cross, here. it's just, it's just too taxing. I get you. I guess, you know, as we wrap up the podcast, is there any sort of, you know, thinking about what we've talked about for the last couple hours, is there anything that you'd like to leave the audience with, whether it's a student listening to this for pieces of advice, um, where we're going for the future, any pieces of advice that you would give to people that may be listening to this about your perspectives on your journey, your life, what kind of things would you take away? Sort of, you know, what's the elevator pitch if you got some some piece of advice to give people before we finish up yeah. today? What I would say is prioritize honesty. I mean, it's not about, uh, you know, how you look to others. You know, it's, it's not about, you know, pleasing your parents with your, with your job description or title. You know, it's not about, um, 
um, I mean, maybe, maybe prioritize honesty if money is all that matters, but be honest with yourself. And that's so hard. The hardest thing I think is real self-reflection um, where you know, remember me trying to learn languages, me being like, oh, I got Himmler's French and, and all. Uh, and I was bad at it because I really didn't care. I wanted to be the kind of person who could do that, but I didn't care about doing it really. Um, and so self-reflection in a really um, open um, way. I mean, pretend like you're somebody else, maybe, and, and and you're dissecting that person. You really have to be honest with yourself and what your interests are, what your strengths. Actually, strengths don't matter because anyone can become strong at anything um, if you're interested in it. Um, so I would say that, and then um, get a ton of experiences. I mean, don't hold back, right? Uh, take weird classes, sit in on weird classes, you know, read a ton of, of journals and books and whatever. I mean, really invest in the information that you're interested in and start finding a direction with, uh, within that and then find a good advisor find good mentors uh, in life. And so if, if somebody at Drexel um, is listening to this, there's one right there, right? You're, you're right there. And I don't know where your office is in Drexel, but there's a good advisor. There's someone who will give you honest feedback, who will appraise you honestly and, and, and guide you effectively. And so I think that is really what's needed uh, for people to land in a fulfilling career, something that they derive pleasure in, in the further pursuit of. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, Corey, this has been amazing. Thank you. I appreciate the compliments as always. And it's truly been an honor to have you on the podcast. Hopefully we can have you on again in the future, we could probably have gone on for this podcast for five or six hours. Uh, and I think, you know, having you on again would be something that I think our audience, I know that I definitely will welcome and, and value it. I appreciate all the time that you give us. So. I, I heart emoji that and, and <laughs> meaning, meaning that I would, I would happily uh, have a reunion.